The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good morning, folks. This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tommy O'Brien. Let's see what we've got going on this morning. We have the ES Mini of about 0.18% pre-market with the Russell up 0.87%. NQs uh, down minorly, 0.07%, really flat. The YM up about 0.29%. Gold contract trading at 1988 and 40 cents. Silver at 23.95. Had a great run up this week in silver, the lower dollar. The copper contract trading at three dollars and 71 cents. The light Swede crude con uh, <laughs> contract trading at 73.85. Take a look here. Tesla still trading down. We're at 232.63. Still dynamics at 109.88. Now we have the dollar breaking down a lot lower. Um, we're getting back to that 103 level, uh, currently trading at 104.07. Um, if we get lower movement today, right, so we have this massive leg down, we're kind of bouncing at that 104 level. Uh, if we do get a breakdown further in the dollar, that is obviously going to be positive for the market uh, as a whole. And so we're eagerly awaiting to see what it will do today. Uh, I know Basil is going to go over a lot of the currency pairings today as well during his show, so make sure you tune in for that. That'll be right after this segment, uh, excuse me, this show. The QQQ trading at 385.74. We have Google trading at 137.65. Meta at 332.54. Disney, again, love to see it. We're up at 94.73. Uh, Bob Iger had made some revamps regarding uh, prices uh, for accessing his parks. So we've gotten some good moves with that. Apple at 189.87 in the SPY at 450.89. Take a look today. I want to look at Amazon this morning. Um, see if I can find it. There we go. So not a massive move on the news, but we have some of the kind of like car dealership stocks. They're going down pretty significantly. Essentially, what Amazon's going to do is they're uh, having online car sales. And that's going to start with Hyundai, right, which is pretty massive. Uh, starting next year, you'll be able to buy a car on Amazon for the first time. The company announced a deal with Hyundai uh, that will allow dealerships to sell cars through the site. Previously, customers could browse car showrooms and compare prices on Amazon but not actually buy the car. And this will change next year when several Hyundai dealerships start to list models for sale on the site. Customers can browse cars on the site and make purchase uh, excuse me, make a purchase using the preferred payment methods. This is great. Uh, they can then choose to pick the car up at a nearby dealership. And, and I wonder if this will get kind of looked at by some legislators. Um, you know, Amazon has such a wide kind of breadth of services that they're looking into, right? Um, and if it starts suppressing local car dealerships in any kind of way, um, and they really start dominating the market, I could see maybe some pursuit in antitrust. And, and you know, we at least see um, in Europe and the UK that that happens a lot with Amazon. Um, and I could see that kind of transferring into the uh, United States as well. So we'll see how that turns out. Um, obviously, we're still about like a year away from that. Uh, excuse me, we're still about a few months away from that starting next year. Uh, so we'll kind of see how that turns out. Um, Amazon is also starting to trial uh, basically pharmaceutical deliveries with drones which would be interesting as well. I think that would be a game changer for a lot of people who are kind of locked uh, in their home, uh, given their kind of medical conditions, um, and this would make it a lot easier. Uh, and you think about it this way as well, you know, people will have to take uh, medications for like mental health. A lot of the times what happens is um, they start feeling better, you know, it kind of gets on this kind of wave, and then they stop taking the medication, they stop going to pick it up, uh, they still can't really... Um, plan things in their life. I just, I, I have a friend that, um, or just like an associate, I guess, um, who basically needs medication like that and he takes it, he feels better and then he just stops going, right? And he stops going to the doctors, he stops going to the pharmacy. So, uh, and then obviously things spiral out of control with that. 
So something like Amazon delivering medications via drone where it kind of like cuts out the effort on the sick person's part will be massive, I think, just for society in general. But I also think um, that will be good for Amazon's bottom line uh, as well. As part of the deal, uh, Amazon's Alexa voice assistant, they're going to start integrating this with Hyundai vehicles at least, um, which is interesting. I'm not sure how much that actually contributes to the, the value of Amazon stock, uh, but it is interesting to see it kind of spread out like that. Uh, so 48 states have laws that limit or ban manufacturers from selling vehicles directly to consumers. That's obviously started to shift a little bit with Tesla, I believe. Um, they have no independent dealerships, of course. They just sell straight to consumer. I know they uh, obviously have showrooms, but that's not really the dealership. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Amazon can kind of uh, essentially sidestep that legislation. We'll see what moves on from there. And take a look at Starbucks today. Uh, they have a strike going on. And that, that this company uh, always gets strikes for some reason. Uh, has very active uh, employee base. Uh, Starbucks workers have filed more complaints with New York City alleging the coffee chain violated the Fair Work Week law. Um, this obviously is on the back of a lot of different companies having to pay off uh, for violating some of these laws. Uh, Chipotle paid $20 million to workers uh, to settle fair work week violations. They paid $1 million to the city of New York. Um, there are some deals with Stellantis and the Auto Workers Union that was just passed. We'll talk a little bit about that. Look into Starbucks, what's going on here. Uh, the New York's fair work week law said that employees have to give their workers regular schedules from week to week, 14 days notice of their scheduled hours, and extra pay for shift changes, among other requirements. Starbucks uh, baristas have repeatedly accused the company of running afoul of the law. Uh, they have filed nearly 90 complaints with the city related to the law since February. The allegations come to Starbucks baristas um, at more than 200 locations nationwide strike Thursday on the company's busy Red Cup promotion day, of course. It's a good day to uh, kind of leverage what you want there. Uh, to celebrate the holiday season, Starbucks every year gives away reusable Red Cups, of course. Starbucks Workers United said the strike is protesting understaffing at the company's locations, particularly on promo promotion day. Uh, workers are also demanding that Starbucks turn off mobile ordering on future promotion days. Convenient mobile ordering has become important to Starbucks business customers. So essentially, yeah, I, and this is what's interesting too, right? We're like, I wonder how the balance of employment is in the country um, because you see a lot of like service places um, are kind of understaffed, right? People are like working um, pretty long hours and overtime. And I see that uh, in similar locations, at least here and in Tampa as well. Um, but then we're also in an environment where um, you know, the Fed would like lower employment as well. Uh, so, you know, it'd be interesting to see. I, I think there probably is just a wrong distribution or like an unequal distribution throughout like the economy itself. We're seeing a lot of the tech companies just shave jobs entirely. Um, obviously, I don't think they'll be moving into the service. I mean, it's probably some of them, but not things like Starbucks. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see this happening in New York as well, uh, especially with a higher unemployment rate. Um, and Starbucks is usually good at this, so I think this will probably resolve pretty quickly. But um, it didn't look like it really hit the company that much whatsoever. Uh, you had a really high volume day gapping up. Um, let's see, I mean, from about 90 all the way to above 100. I think the highest on that day was 102.12. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years 
years' experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Before we left, we were talking about Starbucks, um, having a strike going on. Let's talk a little bit about Baba, okay? So, that is Alibaba, of course. So, we have a massive volume down here. We're trading down 2.89% right now, down uh, or at 76.82 from its highest tick up this past week, about 87.75. Um, this is uh, tangible evidence that the chip ban is actually uh, having its desired effect. Uh, in China, the U.S. chip ban for China. Um, what has happened is, well, you have two things going on right now, right? Uh, Jack Ma has sold a lot of his shares, um, trying to get kind of like, I guess, like hedge himself against what's going on uh, between the U.S. and China. Uh, but more so, they've scrapped their cloud business concept, which is a huge driver uh, for Alibaba's price here. Um, they scrapped plans to spin off its cloud business, citing uncertainties created by U.S. export curbs on chips used in artificial intelligence applications. Obviously, that ban happened last month, um, and that was to ban export to China of chips used in artificial intelligence, and has created major uncertainties for the country's big tech companies. Tencent Holdings said on Wednesday uh, that it saw the curbs impacting its cloud services. And this really does hamper like Chinese society as a whole if they can't uh, kind of keep up with this stuff. Uh, Thursday's announcements came alongside inline second quarter revenue from the Chinese e-commerce group, which in March had unveiled plans to carve out the cloud business as part of the biggest restructuring uh, in its 24-year his history. Uh, the company also put a hold on plans for initial public offering of its Fresh Chippo groceries business, uh, but said it would prepare external fundraising for international digital commerce group arms. Uh, yeah, all of this kind of got hit. Um, let me see here. I don't know if I have the story on Mike Ma, essentially his family just sold off uh, a bunch of shares in it as well, which is kind of compounding this. The company appointed, obviously, the new Eddie Wu, who's pushing all this kind of stuff, and then obviously the chip bans occurred, and uh, this hit even harder. Uh, he says Alibaba will not pursue a full spinoff of Cloud Intelligence Group in light of uncertainties created by recent U.S. export restrictions on advanced computing chips. Instead, the group had focused on the growing, excuse me, on growing the cloud business and providing investments for its AI drivers. He said the cloud unit will continue to maintain its independent operation. Uh, regulatory filings also revealed on Thursday that Ma's family trust plans to sell 10 million American depository shares of Alibaba Group Holdings for about $871 million. Uh, and that's kind of like the ticker with all of this. Um, I 
you, you know, I mean, I guess regarding like what China is going to do with this, obviously there's uh, talks between our president and uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, apparently those were decent and productive to some certain extent. Um, now, I still think it is a major security risk, not just for America, but for the West as a whole, um, for China to get a hold of the, I mean, you know, I say it like that, uh, but, but the, the point is, is just like, you know, these are, these are really big, um, they, these give us like a competitive edge, um, you know, not only in uh, commerce, but also physical security. And so it's just, it, it's important to understand where these chips are going and who gets the chips. And um, that's kind of just the nature of how the game is played, I suppose. Um, China has made some developments regarding producing chips on their own. Um, but they're, you know, they're nowhere near what the West can do, at least with ASML and IBM, too. Uh, so we'll see kind of how that develops. Um, if China can put in enough money and create a competitive, which this would be the time to do that, obviously. Um, you know, we could see, a, honestly, a divergence in the economies or at least an uncoupling regarding that. Right. And China could be a bit stronger. You know, they haven't innovated as much. Um, that's kind of like they're. You know, how, how, how do I say that's how you can kind of characterize the country. There's not a lot of innovation with that, um, but they can really like produce a lot and um, kind of finish things. For instance, they're now going to have their first full EV. Um, and they're going to auto, they're going to mass produce this. This is with Lee Auto. This is coming in February, right? And I was reading this uh, like last night, and that's what I think is so interesting about China, right? Like in the West, it takes us like a long time. Obviously, we have Tesla producing these things. Um, all the traditional uh, car companies are starting to produce their own EVs. But what China can do, and, and maybe it's not the top of the line, and maybe it's not the best, and there might be like some glaring issues with some of the products, but they can take it and then really see it through to the end. Um, and I find that unique about uh, that culture and the economy as well. At least regarding Li Auto, on Friday it will start mass production, delivery of its first fully electric car in February, uh, as the up-and-coming Chinese automaker bets on fast charging technology to solve a range um, anxiety for EV users. So they're calling this the multi-purpose vehicle. Okay, it's great. It has an 800 volt charging architecture, and they are using Chinese batteries. So this will be interesting to see. It's uh, a little bit more expensive than what is going on in China, uh, but people want to buy uh, more Chinese products in China. Yes, they have uh, the same kind of concept we do in America. We want to buy American. They also want to buy Chinese. And the government uh, does a good job at fostering that kind of appetite uh, among its people. So it'll be cool to see how that evolves. Of course, I, it's not always as refined as it is in the West, as I'm saying, um, but you can see it really occur on a, on a wide scale and kind of extrapolate that to uh, possibilities in the US, which I think is pretty cool. On that same note, since there are security issues with China and the US has obviously had that import ban, Microsoft, you know, I mean, this is a really great upward movement, right? Azure is doing phenomenally. Obviously, that's their cloud. Uh, this acquired Blizzard. Um, you know, in theory, you could get to a point where Microsoft is uh, how you call like, you know, you have like Hulu and Netflix, they could be that for video games essentially, right? One of the really cool things I find, especially with Azure, is you have these, you know, I mean, you have cloud servers basically, right? And you can just spin these off and it doesn't necessarily matter what you have on your computer, right? Because you're using cloud resources. Now, of course, um, you know, graphics processing and CPU do, do play a role in that, right? And how much, um, you know, how much you can make of the cloud. What I see Microsoft doing, and I think they already do it at least on the computer, right? Uh, my friend's kid, she's like 11 years old, and uh, I saw her sitting on the computer and she was playing like an Xbox game on the computer, which if, you know, when I was that age, I mean, that would have been the best thing in the world, right? And it then hit me, I just, I've been out of that for so long, obviously, but then it hit me, it's like, this is really the future, right? It's like not just streaming videos, I mean, it's streaming video games, and this kind of lowers the barrier to entry that, uh, you know, Microsoft experience with new users, given that their Xbox and all their other gaming stations are so expensive, right? Well, now you can just go ahead and subscribe to the service and just play it on your computer, right? Uh, I think this is massive. So how does this kind of affect what we're talking about with the chips? How does this affect Microsoft? Because that's some risk exposure they have. Um, they essentially say that it's not a big deal and they're totally fine with not focusing on China, which is interesting. Uh, so let's take a look at this a little bit. 
It says Microsoft is not focused on China as a domestic market, though the company has notable Chinese customers with operations outside the world's second most populous country. Uh, it says we're mostly focused on the global market outside of China. A lot of the Chinese multinationals operating outside of China are our bigger AI customers. It's interesting. You know, there's also an, the, another tangible risk for Microsoft is with this is, um, you know, you're putting your operating system uh, in a country where the government is pretty bent on cracking uh, different things, right, different bits of technology. Um, and so, you know, that, that has a huge, uh, like I say, like risk surface with it as well. Might not be as apparent um, with Chinese companies working, let's say, like in the Balkans or in Africa. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you ready to take your trading to the next level? Introducing Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, your key to successful active trading. Tom O'Brien, renowned for his expertise in the financial markets, has designed Market Insights to be your daily guide to profitable trades. Tom publishes his daily Market Insights newsletter every market day before the market open, along with updates when warranted. Stay ahead of the game with Tom's real-time analysis and trade recommendations delivered straight to your inbox. Whether you're a seasoned trader or just starting out, Market Insights provides the edge you need to navigate the markets with confidence. Ready to join the ranks of successful traders? Head over to TFNN.com and subscribe to Market Insights today. Don't miss out on this opportunity to supercharge your trading results. Market Insights comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for all new subscribers, so you have nothing to risk. Don't miss out on this opportunity to revolutionize your trading game. Head over to TFNN.com right now to join the thousands of traders who have already experienced the power of Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, firsthand. TFNN, educating investors. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com and hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com and hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. Sorry, I was just reading the email. <laughs> okay, refocus again. Okay, we're on market open right now. We're at 9.30. We have the ES Mini trading at 45.23. We have the Russell trading at 17.90. 90 cents. We're sideways right now, essentially, and everything. NQ down about 0.2% at 15,867. Uh, the YM uh, down, well, we're up 0.15% right now. 
and the gold contract trading at 19.86 and 50 cents. Let's take a look at what the dollar's doing. What the dollar doing? It's 104.13. We're really looking for this to break down today, and if we can get some convicted move uh, down from this area, we'll be set to go in the markets. And this is going to kind of herald a green market for the day. We have Disney trading at 94.76, and the SPY still at 4.50. Again, that is on an ABC up to the 462 area. If you want to know more about that, you can go to TFN.com. Go to newsletters. You can sign up for Market Insights as a 30-day money-back guarantee if you decide that you do not like the service. Check it out. All right, what are we looking at? Talking a little bit more about Microsoft. I'm not going to go much more into it. Essentially, they're okay with not being in China, and they don't think it's going to hit their bottom line that hard, uh, which is actually pretty reassuring if you uh, are a Microsoft bag holder. So this has had a really stellar move since October, um, and uh, we'll see what comes out. Again, Azure is massive. It's um, getting more market share. I'll say, too, I had a, one of my, my mentors, um, he... He worked for the DOD. He was doing cybersecurity and everything. Uh, now he works for another company, and they use Azure. Uh, and he said it's amazing. He's like, one, I don't know why they have me here. You know, they, it's a, he's a pretty, uh, they, they pay highly for his position. Um, but for Azure, you just kind of, you just set uh, kind of settings, essentially, for security. And a lot of it is done on the back end. We were talking yesterday um, how a lot of people want a one-stop shop um, for IT and security. And uh, Microsoft is at least doing that within their cloud. Uh, so that's pretty neat. And I like that for the company. Uh, some quote unquote breaking news for the day. Uh, UAW members finally ratify new contract with Chrysler owner Stellantis. Stellantis was actually about to buy people out of their um, retirements uh, earlier to see if they could try to get some more money or um, on the longer term, essentially. Uh, obviously, this strike has done pretty um, significant things to the company as well. Let's take a look here. United Auto Workers members at Chrysler owner Stellantis have ratified a new labor contract following a historically contentious round of bargaining between the union and company, according to the preliminary results posted Friday by the union. And what's interesting, too, is I think you saw Subaru, uh, as well as some other companies, um, <laughs> watching all this going on. Uh, they now are making more deals with their employees, right, uh, to kind of prevent something like this from occurring. Um, and that just must be a pretty, you know, pit in the stomach feeling for Stellantis. So they're the ones who are getting like so heavily targeted. And these other companies are honestly making like not as extreme concessions um, in order to try to, uh, you know, get the eye of Sauron off them, I suppose. Uh, the deal is the second this week for the Detroit automakers. A deal with GM uh, received 54.7% support from UAW GM who voted. According to preliminary results published by the union, UAW members with Ford Motor are on pace to also ratify their agreement but are continuing to vote Friday. A majority of Stellantis facilities overwhelmingly approved the deal, which, like GM and Ford, includes at least 25% wage increases, which is pretty significant. Uh, it also includes the reopening of an Illinois plant that had been indefinitely idled. However, the deal has received notable objection at the automaker's Jeep plants in Toledo. According to the UAW's vote tracker, the deal was supported by 68.4%. Okay, that's good. So yeah, hopefully we can see, I don't know, what's GM trading at? Yeah, not, not any big moves on the news, at least, uh, for, for GM's deal that they made. But yeah, we'd been following that a little bit, so I thought it might be uh, smart to kind of open up and see what's going on with that. Uh, Volvo is down today, um, down about 14%, record low. Uh, Chinese Holdings Group sold off a lot of them. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, 100 million shares, they got hit. They're also going to have some supply issues going forward. Uh, Volvo, of course, is a pretty solid vehicle anyways, um, but they are having supply issues. Let's see what else. If there's any like important news to read in that, yeah, no. But that's just why they're going down if you're holding it. Take a look. This is really big news for Eli Lilly. Obviously, we've seen it with Novo Nordisk as well. Uh, this is trading at 5.88.55 cents. So retail investors crowded into Eli Lilly after weight loss drug approval. This is massive. Retail flows in Eli Lilly spiked uh, more than a two-year high in November. Small investors rushed to buy the stock after the U.S. pharma major received highly anticipated approval for its weight loss drug Zepind. Uh, daily net purchasers, excuse me, purchases surged to $14.4 million on November 8th when Zepind 
was clear to the U.S. and U.K. And then, of course, Novo Nordisk has Wagovi. What is, you know, we look at this, too, like, at, what is the implication on a cultural level, right? Like, obviously, if you're, this is huge, um, you know, in a financial sense, right? Uh, obesity treatment has surged in recent years, okay? Uh, I think it's something like up like 100 and, like 28%, I think I read the other day, um, you know, cost into, into treating obesity in the U.S. You have other countries that are, you know, quote unquote, modernizing and they are suffering with vast amounts of obesity. This is the case uh, in Mexico, namely, uh, but you'll see it in other countries, probably in South America starting. So this, you know, it's good that this happens, right? So people are obese and uh, they need to take these drugs to kind of lower it. But I think we run into some issues. First, uh, with Zepand and Wagovi, you actually can start to see um, muscular wasting with these kind of drugs, right? I worry too. Now, there are people who are obese that uh, there are definitely some biological um, markers going on there or like activity going on there. Uh, maybe their metabolism is slower during the daytime due to whatever reason. Um, but I, I worry that with the advent of something like this, it won't be focused enough um, on in society of like healthier practices for people, right? So you might not be obese, uh, but do you still suffer some of the same consequences? And I, and I say this like in, you know, like mentally, right? Um, I have periods when, you know, I, I train a lot um, in MMA, but there are periods where I'll stop and I'll still be eating a lot and gain like some extra weight and I definitely feel sluggish. Uh, my brain is more clouded um, and my overall quality of life is just a lot lower, right? Like if I take this drug, Okay, yeah, I might look, look better, but am I still going to feel this way? So that's something to consider, right? Uh, I think lifestyle changes um, are also very necessary in first world countries, uh, at least in America. Europeans have done a better job at this. Um, you know, I look at like Iceland and some of the Nordic countries and certainly Germany that are like focused on um, activity. And the U.S. This isn't, hasn't been historically the case, although it's changing. Uh, the quality of life and then therefore really the output of the citizens um, – is so much improved by this kind of physical activity, right? And again, I fear that with these kind of drugs coming out, there's not going to be the impetus uh, for the average person to try to pursue this kind of lifestyle um, because the you know apparent effects of um, you know not having that lifestyle won't be present. If that makes sense, right? I'm trying to like say everything straightforward, but. Um, yeah, regardless, I, I, I think that this is going to be huge for these companies and more weight loss drugs will probably come uh, in the coming years. And uh, that'll be just a huge, huge market. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFM. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the Opening Call newsletter at TFNN.com. The Opening Call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. 
the Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. Let's take a look what we're looking at. We got one segment here. We got a normal segment and then one short one after this. Let's take a look. We were talking a little bit about digital currencies yesterday. Well, first, let's, before we do that, let's just look here. This right. There we go. So gaps up 24.22%. That's pretty solid for a company like that. Uh, let's see, we're trading at 1696 right now. Uh, the low from the day prior was about 1347, 1346. So gap shares soar on Old Navy brand renewal and then controlled inventory. Uh, they're 20% uh, pre-market. We're now trading up 4% from that uh, basis-wise. So basically, like last year, Walmart and Target gap discounted heavily to clear excess stocks due to weaker demand for non-essential products and aggravated by out-of-style clothing at the company's brands. Reported quarter results uh, were driven by improvement in Old Navy and leaner inventory. That's massive. You know, that's another thing too that I think is pretty impressive. We, we have this culture in America of fast fashion, right? And, and really this concept is like, you have this trend in today and you have it out next week. And when you're these large kind of retailers, you, you have to try to, you know, you either choose something that's kind of like vanilla middle of the road um, or you hyper specialize and only choose a little bit of it, right? And so, like the you know accounting and management that goes in to some of these companies to try to, like I said, you know, like this article says, like kind of slim down the amount of inventory it has um, and be more controlled in what it's putting out uh, is is pretty extraordinary, honestly. And uh, if you're someone who does that, uh, you know, I'm here Monday filling in for Tommy. Give, give me a call and uh, we can talk about that because I think that's really interesting. Um, anyways, reported quarter results were driven by an improvement, obviously, at Old Navy and leaner inventory, and encouragingly, November to date, sales trends have improved modestly from the third quarter. Comparable sales at Old Navy rose 1% in the third quarter, uh, the first increase in 10 quarters, which is pretty solid. Uh, Old Navy gained market share, an encouraging early proof point that worked to improve both product assortment and brand messaging. Gap struggles with outdated inventory at its namesake brand and Old Navy had pushed uh, customers to look for newer and fresher styles. Although, you know, I think what could be, and this is so interesting to me, what is the uh, champion is the brand, right? Uh, and back in the day, like, especially when I was a kid, champion was just like the the weird off-brand kind of sportswear, yeah? Um, same, with, same with Fila, right? And then in recent times, they've just had this complete like rebranding right i mean it's it's still the same thing it still looks the same um but just a few influencers uh start started taking to it and now they're they're massive companies right or they're massive product lines at least uh you know gap is definitely what would be considered uncool and so is old navy as well um but 
what is so interesting in this day and age is all you need is, like I said, a few influencers to wear your stuff, to really push it and say, hey, look how good this is, blah, blah, blah. And uh, it can really take off. So that would be interesting to see if, you know, there can be kind of like a comeback um, with fashionability regarding these brands. I don't know. I'm just kind of musing on that. I think it's a little bit interesting. Uh, the apparel makers executives also alluded to longer recovery time for Banana Republic. Yeah, they've lost out a lot and their quality has gone down. And uh, Athleta, I'm not super familiar with that uh, line anyway, uh, which has seen product misfires and weak retail execution. So, yeah. Gap doing quite all right this morning, up 26.5%. Uh, it's probably a nice morning to wake up and see that if you're a long-term Gap holder. We're looking at like three years. Yeah, I mean, just kind of like a dead stock for a while. Interesting. All right, we're moving on. We were talking about the digital currencies yesterday uh, and how some of the central banks want to start adopting it. Uh, there were some talks in Singapore regarding that, and so the, Singapore came out and said that they're actually going to try to uh, do a pilot run of uh, the wholesale use of uh, central bank digital currencies. That's going to start in 2024. Um, let's see how it's going to, I'm going to give you something here. Yeah, so it's essentially just a pilot one. The wholesale CBDC is a digital currency issued by a central bank that's used exclusively by the central banks, commercial banks, or other financial institutions to settle large value interbank transactions. It's unlike retail CBDCs, which cater to individuals and businesses facilitating everyday transactions. Since 2016, the MAS has conducted many experiments with other central banks and financial industry to explore the use of wholesale CBDCs on distributed ledgers to facilitate real-time cross-border payments and settlements. And again, that's what I've, this concept is what I've been saying is so interesting about the blockchain in general is that you can kind of make these unique little hubs that transcend general um, boundaries, which I think is pretty neat. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about how that would kind of be realized uh, on the show Monday. And we'll see how that goes. Uh, banks will issue tokenized bank liabilities in the form of claims and balance sheets currently. Retail customers can then use the tokenized bank liabilities in transactions with merchants, who will then credit these bank liabilities with their respective banks. Tokenization refers to the process of issuing a digital form of an asset on a blockchain. The CBDC will then be automatically transferred to the merchant as a form of payment during transaction. Now, that's, this is more the domestic just use of it, right? And they're going to pilot that as well. Uh, and that's kind of how something like that would work. It's kind of interesting. However, you have MasterCard uh, had come out and said that they don't see this adopting as quickly, right? Like there's a lot of... Well, well, let's read the article here. So this MasterCard says wide adoption of central bank digital currencies would be difficult right now. Uh, the MasterCard blockchain and digital assets uh, leads the Asia Pacific, and this is MasterCard's blockchain itself. And what a, I mean, I really am impressed with this company for doing that. I think they were one of the first uh, to really hop on this concept and kind of conceptualize it and run with it, right? And, and you know, novelly use blockchain for the purposes it was developed for. Uh, said there isn't enough justification for the widespread use of central bank digital currencies right now, which makes the broad adoption of such assets difficult. Um, and this was from the MasterCard's lead on blockchain and digital assets. Uh, the difficult part is adoption. So if you have CBDCs in your wallet, you would have the ability for you to spend uh, it anywhere you want, very similar to cash today. Um, and again, this is the retail CBDC. Uh, it's quite interesting, and I think that's I think that's the truth, and that's really obviously the central banks can trade whatever they want between each other, and people can have opinions on that, but it's not really going to you know um, affect them so outwardly as kind of like a retail uh, digital currency would, right? And I think I was speaking yesterday that would be a major issue in America. I, I think a lot of people would be opposed to that. I think a lot of people don't trust the government, uh, nor do they trust. Uh, you know, the Federal Reserve or, you know, whoever is really going to be issuing this kind of thing. Um, so that would be quite difficult. And I think the only way you would get it to be adopted immediately would be through means that would further erode trust in the American people. Um, and again, I'm not, for me, like uh, the purposes of now, like I don't really have, um, you know, a moralization on these things, but um, I can just kind of see that would be the outcome uh, of trying to force that on people. Um, although I do see moving forward that digitalization is uh, absolutely the future. I think we're going to continue to digitalize everything that we have. Um, 
It'll be interesting to see how that kind of shakes out. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back for a short segment. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at tfnn.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at tfnn.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. This is Jacob Sheep filling in for Tommy O'Brien. I will be with you on Monday as well. It was a short segment here. Let's take a look at this. This is something that I think uh, a lot of the younger generation deals with. I speak about this a lot. Uh, so this is Fed's Barkin that said this. Housing is unattainable for too many Americans. So Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin said Wednesday that home ownership is becoming unattainable for too many workers. And the key is to juice more supply of homes on the market. Uh, this is the quote here. The math all too often just doesn't work. Barkin said in a speech at the Virginia Governor's Housing Conference in Hampton. To improve the math, he said, housing supply needs to increase. Uh, Barkin offered up a litany of ideas for states and localities, including issuing more permits for private single-family homes, reducing unnecessary regulation, and lobbying those who don't want their towns or communities changed. He also cited some examples of changes in certain parts of the U.S. designed to welcome more housing and boost supply. Uh, one government body in Virginia, Wise County, implemented a tax incentive for renovation, rehabilitation, or replacement of residential and commercial properties. 
Uh, in West Virginia, he said a newly created Build WV program offers tax exemption for purchasing construction materials, 10-year property value tax credit, and the potential for a business and occupation uh, tax exemption. And what's interesting, in I was reading the Tampa Bay Times, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have a lot of people here, and uh, it's extremely difficult to uh, try to buy a home. Uh, home prices are very high in this area, and you say, okay, we'll just leave, move somewhere else. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of a hard thing to say as well. Uh, you know, how, how long you have to travel into the city, the commute is very important. Um, yeah, Cost-wise, obviously cars are expensive, gas is starting to be a little bit more expensive. Um, I do know people who live maybe like 40 minutes south and they commute into town for work um, and it makes them pretty miserable overall and there's kind of no end in sight for that. Um, what I was reading the Tampa Bay Times is there's a lot of motels around here, so people are kind of like cutting into their savings, essentially, to basically live in the hotels, right? So their families aren't on the street and they're waiting for assistance to come. It's a pretty big mess, but um, at least we have some people, um, you know, in key places that are understanding that this is a real issue and uh, looking for kind of solutions. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we have Basil on next. Uh, he was saying in the den yesterday that he's going to go over currency pairings, how they're really a key level. So stay tuned for that. I'll be with you Monday.